Hey, good evening, everybody. It's actually been a little while since we've had a 1466. I just notice now, just as I get started, that even though I set the exposure before, it's decided now. Nah, now I'm going to make it nice and low exposure. Very sorry about that. Hopefully I'll improve once all the silver backing is gone. Hey, Upman, Jim. A joke from Croatia. Travis. Crazy. Okay, let's see. So yeah, this is a bit of an... Okay, this is the 3437. I had a suspicion it was because when I was preparing it... I could see that the current was like doing 400, 0, 400, 0, and then runs. So that's a pretty good sign that you've got a 3437. Or you've got other issues. Yeah, just update that. Update the scanner. Marvellous. Battery off. Looks like we've got some liquid damage, but that actually looks more like flux. So I'm guessing that this has been tweaky tweakied. Hey Rose. It's got the good style drive on them. Although the only trouble with these drives, even though they won't die from controller failure, they are now starting to get to the point where they are suffering from just natural wear. Which is a bit sad. I guess not everything can live forever. And this is a field replacement unit, which is fun. So we've got the FRU stamp and we've got the Apple sticker, so it's a double whammy of hell. So we don't know whether we're going to be dealing with a resurgence of an old fault or whether we're going to be dealing with a new one. Yeah, that's right. I'm graffitiing on everything. Okay, okay something. Funky has happened with the display connector. Although the pins look intact, it just looked like it kind of got stuck on itself. Uh, the Wi Fi, one of the connectors was off. Might have been a case if they just didn't bother to reattach it properly. Oh, God, I hate this. I hate, hate, hate it when people do this. Alright, if you're working on 1466s, please, please be mindful of the Wi-Fi cables. Okay, they are delicate little coaxial cables. And if you do this, I will get on a plane and come and nut punch you for doing this. Okay, so don't do that. See how that is pinched under there? You've basically crushed the shielding of that flex, that cable into the core most likely. You're going to have reduced signal strength amongst other things. Okay, don't do it. Be smart. Pull this cable assembly out. Screw this down to the chassis and then put this cable back down. Okay, it means you've got to, uh, it means you've got to undo these two here. The big whoop. It's a small thing to do compared to redoing the entire antenna assembly. Intensely dislike. No, I'm, I'm gonna. Yeah, no. <sighs> it's just frustrating because it's. You have to know that you're doing it. You have to know that you're doing it when you're talking down that screw, and you can see the poor little cable screaming for its life as you crush it to death. But it doesn't stop these people. 
There. Yeah, that's mangled. That's that's mangled. Mangled like roadkill. Look at that. See? Absolutely jacked up now. If we're lucky, we'll still get enough Wi-Fi signal and I'll just simply report that um, due to technician incompetence, the signal will never be as good as it was. Yeah, Miles, that was probably a good idea too. Although I would like to get my personal dissatisfaction out, so the punch could still be nice to deliver. No doubt, though, someone out there is screaming at me for writing on the back on the back of all the parts. So I'll put them all in a box so that you know they're all together. Don't write on the customer's equipment. It is not your uh, what do you call it? Graffiti land. Respect the customer's equipment. The other fun thing here is that the CPU fan shroud, uh, the heatsink fan shroud is missing as well. Huzzah. It doesn't take much, it's just, it is an inconvenience because you've got to have a T8 Torx driver, but it just saves. Alright, so we've got a big lump of flux there. This has definitely had its share of work on it. Yeah. This could be an interesting one. Damaris, welcome back. Screaming and audibly. Oh, you, you're screaming now at um, my graffitiing? Let's hope so. Alexi, uh, Andrew Hughes is here. Uh, thank you, Damaris, for the 500. It always goes towards a nice coffee. Okay, so, yeah, we've got the double issue of an FRU and... Dear yeah, God, there's flux everywhere. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, the screen's probably jacked. Oh, wow, that's, that's a very, very upset filter set there. Explosive prejudice is what this has experienced. Okay, so that'll be uh, L8304 which is the three volts to the LC panel. So it's not backlight, this is actually powering the panel. So that's a bit of a concern because that means likely the panel is messed up. Likely. Or if we're really lucky, it's just the cable. Yeah, if we're really lucky. Now that really got down and got melty. Okay. Still doesn't explain the lack of bong. Although maybe nah, I was gonna say maybe the screen's still shorting it, but I would say that's not the case. The filter became the fuse. Mm. I'm trying to work out what's been going on around here. Mm. 
and this is at 1.44 so this is almost again not worth me working on I have enough of these just floating around the same or higher spec that I could drop in but the curiosity drives me and since I cleared out a good number of my items off the queue today I think I'll spend some time here some of those resistors around the BIOS EFI, they look a bit sus and it looks like this has been reworked because out of factory they usually have solder balls out of here just pushing a bit and there's nothing there that I can see by the looks of it I can't really say that something's holding it in reset though because I am getting CPU activity I just can't get over the amount of flux on this thing So we'll consider it our challenge for this evening, as it were. Mm, because it's a set of symptoms, a combination that I've not really experienced. I'm kind of wondering what they were doing up here. Let's have a look and see what that section's for. Chipset current, oh joy. CPU core current sense. What were they doing? Hmm. All right. Honestly, when you get these scenarios, it's often better to just take off everything that they did and do it again yourself. But that chip looks like it's has been replaced. I'm just struggling to think where to start. Okay, the first thing I might do is put this board plugged in the screen and see what our resistance or our diode mode is on that 3v3 for the display hey Jason see you're already into the crazy uh, drunken party behavior Oh wait, uh, what's this? What's this? There's a bit of a F up there, I think. Where's the substance? That feels like super glue to me. What were they doing putting super glue in there? Yep, that's super glue. must mean a reason and it looks like they yeah, why did you super glue that fixing the A1534s isn't that um, that's not really true you can't fix them you can data recovery them nobody fixes them why would you do that to yourself you know it's only going to come back. Okay, give us diode mode. Actually, continuity mode probably just as more entertaining, so to speak. Interesting, there's no apparent short. I wonder if they replaced the screen cable. Well, we can put another filter on there, plug it in and see what happens. So 
I have mine. You've got an iPad to do to my iPad Air 2. It takes normal amp charging until it boots and then only... Yeah. Alright, I'll leave that one to you. What do you think it's going to be? Do you think it's going to be like TriStar or Tigress or something like that? Or do you think it's going to be Hell on Earth? Hey Max Genius from Belgium, good evening. Alright, hey, easy on, easy on. Alright, let's get rid of that filter or replace that filter. I'm just kind of curious to see whether... It, yeah, maybe... Yeah, maybe it is actually booting, but there's no speaker output, and because there's no display output, we can't see either. So maybe it is actually trying to do something, and it's alive, but it just simply... Mind you, I still also don't have 342 properly, so maybe my SMC is dead. Which means we might have a reball on hand. Hopefully this isn't too welded. Yeah, thankfully it was not welded. It's not uncommon when they fail that sort of catastrophically that they end up welding themselves to the board simply because of the fact that the um, compressed iron, the ferrite, becomes a lump of metal and yeah just welds it, literally welds itself to the board I'll tell you the 50 50 90 rule applies for pulling out 165s when you want 34, 37s and vice versa. Yeah, I have just pulled out five 165s in a row, six now, when all I want is a 34, 37. Seven, statistically this is um, a, seriously? Come on, this is a joke. Uh, thank goodness, a fine one. So, on the ninth try, we pulled out a 34-37. So that's pretty damn close to the 50-50-90 um, principle. Jason Arturara is right to repair. Even though my name is not um, Jim. Cody does tech. Good evening to you, Cody. Thank you very much for the two ninety nine. Looks like I'm having more coffee. Hey, Wayne Ashford. Well, we're getting there. We're getting there slowly. Was there one in particular you were interested in? Or are you just talking in general, Wayne? Sometimes being fancy does not end up being faster. 1286, oh you're talking about the one that had the dead GPU on it, the one that had been reflowed, is that right? Sorry Wayne, my, when it comes to names I'm very bad. I presume that's the one you're talking about. Or is there something yet again that I've missed?
Yeah, that's it, right. I was talking to Harold, the guy who makes the um, GPU killer, and he was saying that you can just take the GPU off and we can have a look and see if that's possible. Otherwise, I've got a few other 1286s, uh, 2915s if you're interested. I've even got one that's probably already got the GPU killer built on it that I did a while back and I just put aside so we can have a look at just using that one instead we'll have a check on the CPU spec give us an idea whether you know I don't know I don't recall off the top of my head what yours was whether it was a high-end one an i7 or something right my other problem is yeah, we're not getting green light which means SMC could be up the creek which wouldn't surprise me given the amount of trash that seems to be hanging around SMC at the moment Lewis's Discord is an excellent place if you want to just sit around and slowly get messages. So, yeah, if you don't want to have to actively participate right there, right that second, then Lewis's Discord is good. It's nice, it's kind of, it's basically a modernized IRC in some ways. So like halfway between email, I suppose and forums and instant messaging Wait a second, wait. Just hang on there, Wayne. Is this one yours, Wayne? This is the one that we took the heat sink off and we could see that the GPU is reflow. Is this one yours? seeing what this one is. This is a 2.0 megabyte GPU. 2.0, I would have thought that would be an i5. Uh, oh, Wayne, have you still got yours? Uh, I'm confused now, Wayne, I'm sorry. We'll have to, um, I'll have to, you'll have to re-email me. I'm sorry. I was going to say, as soon as you said it goes well, I'm thinking, wait a second, this can't be the one that I'm working on. Because the one I'm working on does not go at all. Okay, let's see if we get a flashbang here. I sincerely hope we don't. If you're going to be looking for a flashbang, it will be in the vicinity of where my finger is. I will, of course, remove my finger before the flashbang. And I'm putting on safety glasses. Well, no flashbang, so it's a good start. But then again, it might not have actually tried to energize the display yet, so we've got to wait for that.
it's crazy. We've got CPU activity on this. It's a very peculiar machine, this one. And we're drawing the right amount for 600 odd. Yeah, 630 milliamp. Not showing anything on display. I'm going to see what 342 is. Yeah, it could be a bad cable. Oh no, it's it's going through some spasms right now. Yeah, it's having spasms. And now it's stopped working. I'm back to 25 milliamp. Okay, that is interesting. Well, while it's misbehaving, I'm going to still see if I can get my 342 measurement. 342 is bang on. So I'm going to guess we probably need, and now I've got flipping MagSafe. Something's very not happy here. Did we get a blinky folder, did we? Hey, Van Lopez. It had a question mark. Okay, cool. Not that I don't believe you all, but I'm going to wait and see for myself. Ah, well, what do you know? You're telling the truth. So what the heck's going on? There's obviously something quite intermittent still going on. Let's see if it boots. Yeah, it's booting. And I'm going to put a battery in and see if it charges too. Okay, battery in. Makes you wonder whether maybe it's something like just the junk maybe all the flux on the board is the problem that does happen you know you get too much flux on the board in the wrong place and it's contaminated with other stuff and it will uh, refuse to boot It's still definitely unhappy about something. I mean, it's not even putting up a progress bar yet. Oh, here it comes. Maybe it's just a bad uh, DC inboard. It's entirely possible. It's taken its time because I don't have a fan on and the keyboard and the tracker, everything's disconnected at the moment. So it's understandable that it is taking its time. I may as well kill it because I can't do anything anyway when it comes up. And of course I can't kill it because the keyboard's disconnected. <laughs> oh, no. okay, so the battery. Okay, that battery does not hold any charge at this point. I'll go get a test battery that I know works and we'll see if that can maintain it, its life. At least I think I've got a test battery around here. 
thinking I have one and having one are two very distinctly different things in this workshop. Parts 404. I think the complaint is that the person said that this is the second battery that was tried. Not that that's actually a guarantee that it's not the battery. Because with these batteries I have found many a times you can easily get two or three duds in a row. And that is why you want, as we say, a known good working one. One that you know does in fact work. So that you can go, okay we can now test and prove that it is something other than the battery. Yeah, I don't think it's just the battery because this is spinning up. But this is the second battery we tried. Uh, chances are it's probably not even the right one. Let's see, which model have I got here? 1496. Yeah, actually, that is the right one, I think. Yeah, 1496 is correct. Yeah, miles exactly. Known good, not new. You can have new known good and old known good, but it doesn't mean you won't have new not good. Okay, it is still slow on the boot, and that is in spite of the, f the fact that I have things plugged in. Hey, ZX, I saw you jibber jabbering on my mate Vince's page the other day. Any updates on the house? Uh, things are on hold at the moment because we're actually, I'm not sure if you were here last night, but we're looking to get a second property. There's an opportunity that's opening up to us. Funnily enough, two opportunities that are opening up to us. And we're just trying to decide what we can do. We've got to hear from the bank first, say, you know, see what they want to let us have. The fan isn't going super hard yet. Usually if it's an ME area problem on this, it will tend to rapidly get up to about the first three quarters of the loading bar and then the last quarter takes a very long time. Bod Wareham got a couple of 500 Western Digital Blacks. They were they are good drives, they're durable more than fast. Uh, but these days, you know, most of us don't really even use the spinning hard drives, unless it's like four or more terabytes that we're trying to hold. Soon you'll own the whole town. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to be Mr. Monopoly here. <laughs> take it, buy everything, just buy everything, kick everyone out, charge them exorbitant rates. No, we just, oh, this has gone into, you've forgotten your password section. That explains why that's slow. Okay. That shouldn't be a problem. We'll exit out of that and it should restore back normally. Oh, it's an NVMe SSD. Okay, well, that's a good. Sorry, for some reason I was thinking it was a hard drive. <sighs> so ideally, collectively, if we can pick up the second property, then my overall debt will. I would love it to stay under two hundred thousand right now. 
Uh, Jason, in this town, it's... Um, uh, it's not too bad. Townsville is certainly a much better market. Prices in Townsville, funnily enough, are better than they are in Charters Towers. In Townsville, people are selling up cheap. I think partially because of all the crime. But it's not really, really... It's, it's like when I lived over in South Africa and my parents would ring me up in a real tiz every uh, couple of days like oh we saw the riots going on so and so you know there was someone who got women um, killed by a tire wrapped around their neck and burnt to death and it's like it's like yeah that it's happening it's not great but it's a big country and you know it could be six blocks away and I wouldn't even know about it Uh, what will I use the property for? <laughs> um, basically just um, investment. I need to have something that I can then sell 20 years later sort of thing. That's the theory. And it'll be a good storage area for all the excess stuff. Maybe I might even actually move the business, the workshop, into that property. Okay, all of my sensors are good. Nothing's... I mean, the voltage readings are a little bit strange. They're at zero, but... And so the current readings are all at zero. That's different. Makes me want to load up another 3437 and see if that is consistent. Yeah, I'll hype them on too. <laughs> it, it's actually a surprising number of houses in Charters Towers. But needs to say, yeah, we, we want to try... Um, pick up one of the two places. Now, ideally, I didn't want to spend more than about seventy-five thousand. You know, the less the better. Particularly because one of them, well, actually both of them, are ex they're very derelict houses. The sort of house that you kind of hope that you have insured and gets blown down or catches on fire, you know, something that destroys it, so that you don't have the cleanup bill. But um, that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, we just. Yeah, I don't want to spend more than about absolute max 90 because then that would mean I have a if you put the 20% deposit off I would still be just a bit over 200,000 in debt which is kind of painful I don't really want to be that much I kind of like the fact that I'm you know under 150 at the moment but yeah Actually, Miles, that's what I'm wondering. Like, I don't know Australian business law well enough, particularly in the sole trader perspective. If I buy this property and claim it, you know, make it my business property, can I actually claim that as an offset and basically get tax-free living for the next five years? Or is that just not going to happen? I just, I don't know. Wayne Ashford, do you know any good supplies for batteries, the A1286, not to get off topic? Um, I usually get all my stuff from Broadway here in Australia. I've had some people have issues, but, you know, I'm not sure. Alexi, I already do, I mean, thankfully I own this place now. But, um, yeah, the, the second place I think is more because I haven't had a chance to build up superannuation or any of the other things that normal employees have. I have to go about things a bit of a different way. Pretty good level of debt, 1%. It is. I'm trying to make sure that I keep it realistic and go under the assumption that at some point it's going to go up to about 7%. So I want to make sure that I can pay out even if it gets up to 7 without too much drama. Alright, this board, look, I'll be honest with you, apart from fixing up that screen issue, oh, speaker is the one thing that we haven't been able to, speakers work, yep, speakers work, I think it was basically just a blown backlight um, screen display power, and I think it needs a wash, I think the flux is possibly what's causing the problem. But we'll shut down. Speak to your taxman about the uh, 
Miles, I think the problem is that it's one thing if you do it as a company, it's another if you do it as a sole trader. Sole traders get treated a little bit sort of quirky. I'd say the tax office can, the bank won't be able to. The next problem is going to be that due to the very derelict state of the properties, the bank may be disinclined to actually give me a loan as a home loan. They may say, look, you know, it's it's not a dwelling that's fit for habitation, which would actually be pretty close to truth. Yeah, there's people living in it, but it's a case of like with here, one bank said this place was essentially almost not fit for habitation. And the other evaluator said, well, it just needs some electrical conduit up there to protect those wires, and then you're good to go. So it is a matter of perspective on that thing. Uh, battery, yeah, so I'd say this battery is at fault. I don't, I'm going to plug it back in. I should have done that before taking the board out. So we're going to try it again with this original battery. Miles, I keep forgetting. Are you in Australia? I always forget. I think I've said this a few times now. Regional banks out here essentially aren't really much more than just simply conduits back to the faceless head office people. So it's hard to get that sort of business guidance or anything like that from the local agents. They usually always send out someone or whatever. There you are. I'll, I'll wait and see what they come back with, see what our what do you call it, our um, loan capacity is. Since the loan for this house is with the same bank, they'll be able to say, look, like, hey, you can extend this much further, and then I'll have to decide on whether I want to take that risk or not. Needing 1286, hell no. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Got enough of them. Way too many of them. It's definitely 1286s have now become glut machines, I'm sorry to say, as you will know, because that's why you're flogging them off for nothing. So, that, please, sir, did someone take my stuff. It's interesting. With this bat. Oh, no, now I've got Max out. Bloody hell. Sydney, that's right, yeah. Oh, and Wayne's in Gladstone. Uh, yeah, I'm passing on the triple three O's because I'm finding the triple three O's these days, they're starting to die too. I've sold a couple of triple three O machines to people and they have come back after a while with PCH failures or something like that, so I'm done with them. About the only 1286s I'll consider is maybe the like the selling is a immaculate looking 3115 or something like that. Nothing else. I'm done with moving this stuff because it seems to bite me in the backside. Yeah, the triple three O is the 2915. It is interesting that I'm Holy shit, we actually got a green light. I mean, a bomb. It is interesting that I'm not getting a green light from this thing. So I have a feeling maybe SMC is still a bit dodgy. And... No, uh, uh, something's funky. Oh, okay, that's not reading the keyboard properly. Weird. 
I was holding down that key and oh no, it just came right out. Reflow SMC, yeah, I'm sort of of the philosophy that if I'm going to reflow it, I may as well reball it. That kind of. And I don't know whether I've got a one wire issue or something else, but like I said, we are getting 342. Battery is definitely screwing with something. So it's possible that the battery messed up the I2C lines going into the SMC. But then the other one shouldn't work if that was the case. But yeah, see, we've got, we've got no green. With no green, that's no go. I'll get a genuine one just to see if there's going to be a difference here. Magically roll over all my cables. Okay, so I'm plugging in a genuine 85 watt, genuine MagSafe to it's turned on. Ah, uh, this is interesting. Okay, so we do have an SMC or an I2C issue, comms issue with a genuine brick it's not powering up and that's because with these um, with these sort of hack job so to speak MagSafe DC power supply situations they'll just send the power no matter what but a genuine MagSafe it's saying nay I cannot communicate Alright, we'll try a DC board that is known good, just to see whether it's that. Could also be a bad flex. Okay, it looks like it's a bad DC inboard, maybe. Yep, that's what it is. Let's have a look at what's wrong with this one. Do you get much sleep? Unfortunately not, Wayne. And to be honest, it is actually a serious issue. Um, I spend a little bit too much time during the course of the day feeling like I'm just on the verge of passing out. I don't like it. There's a lot of time being wasted just simply being stuck in that zombie state. And uh, half of it's from anxiety and just anxiousness. Yep, um, I gotta explain this the right way. When I say anxiety, I don't mean like fearful of things. I just mean in terms of nervous uh, legs and stuff like that. Like I, I just want things to get moving. I want things to get moving. It's time is ticking. Sleep is wasteful. That sort of stuff. It's a bad mindset, but it is a mindset that I've seemed to have. So I get to bed at about two thirty, between two and four and it's generally if i'm lucky i'll pick up four hours so yeah i definitely need and then a, the power nap during the day occasionally all right 
Yeah, there's some gnarly corrosion there. Sometimes with the audio under here you get corrosion because the liquid goes into the headphone socket and dribbles down to the back and then shorts out a couple of caps. This one seems fine. If you get a no audio coming up on these 1466s, check the caps that are under there because that often is the cause. Okay, a bit of corrosion there. Looks like there might have been a part there. GAD called midlife crisis. Uh, let's hope not, eh? I would like to repair this because the <laughs> I used to get mocked for repairing these, but they're becoming expensive. Alright, let me compare to my other one. Yeah, I have mean, it's it's really not good. Like I there's no way I could work retail anymore. I would be your classic sleeping person. You know, you'd find me asleep with the hot air running. So we've got some corrosion there, but it's not really, that's just a little solder fill point. It's not really a critical area. Pad's a bit corroded, again, not critical. Yeah, you got your one wire stuff here, that looks alright. There's a bit of corrosion on the USB port, but that's nothing really. I don't know, maybe a ultrasonic clean might fix up whatever's wrong. Otherwise, yeah, I'll just mark it as uh, I suppose a bit of corrosion there. No. Otherwise, I'll just mark it to tell the person that sent it to me. I'll say you got to replace the battery and you got to replace the DC inboard. But certainly, the main board needs a good clean too. Green pad, top left area. Yeah, I think I was looking at that. You're talking about on the six pin chip. I really should put effort into making a board view for this one. Maybe a schematic. Should be able to reverse engineer most of the... Well, not reverse engineer, but should be able to deduce most of the parts on this. Because a lot of it is actually just a replication of existing circuitry on... You know, like if you take from like a um, 3115 board or something like that, the circuitry should be similar. Yeah, I'll see, Pionov, because the problem is apparently it was a new enough battery, but it could have been sitting in storage for a little bit too long. Okay, there's a cap there that is a, might be a little bit dodgy. See how its end is a little bit corroded?
Is a fifteen percent J car clean five out? Oh, you use that kind of combo on the ultrasonic. Okay. I use the imbecile stuff. Up here and off, that might work as a starter reference. So that one's mine. This is going to be a bit of a hack job. It's not going to be a full restoration of all the connections. It's more just going to be a case of, well, can we at least get green light on the start here with their MagSafe, uh, their DC inboard. Let's do nothing. Interesting, okay. It finally did come up. I might throw it in the ultrasonic and see what happens. Hmm. Yeah, I might just throw it in the ultrasonic, see how it comes out. Leave a note to say that it's dubious and if they cannot get it to work reliably, just consider replacing it. It's the safest. Yeah, easiest option outright. Uh, the battery, okay, this one here is mine. So what I'm going to do is I'll put this on the ground with the battery plugged in and then we'll get on with some other stuff. It's very quick to not work again.
could well be that there's corrosion inside that MagSafe assembly itself. Uh, so I'm going to leave that there, see what it does. It is its own master now. Alright, now I'm going to get back to the project that everybody hates. Let's get the software fixed up and maybe get some decent data out of this thing. Okay, so I've got to reflash this with the slightly modified firmware. The firmware that hopefully will stop it from doing the weird repeat of eight or nine times before it actually changes the byte. People are going to be going, what the hell is this? This isn't a MacBook. No, it's not. This is my very wasteful way of coming up with a very limited logic analyzer scope. <laughs> when I can just go and buy one for $30 from <laughs> eBay. But this one I get to have tonight. Or tomorrow night. Or yesterday night. Okay. Okay, so the key that I needed in here is not this RC or TXIE, it's a different interrupt. I need the uh, one where if the buffer goes empty, it has to be enabled. And I've already worked it out and I've just got to cut paste it into here. should do the trick. Hey Chris Stevens, where have you been? Okay, now the fun part where I've got to try and align the inappropriately sized programmer into this. Believe me, I should have done a much... Oops, yep shorted out those connectors just then okay so now I just have to plug this in to my USB 3 port which is probably going to again buggerize up the system and we need 5 volts Spider, what you doing? Who are you? Come here. You're in a bit of a bad place to be. Where are you going? Come here. Oh, you little rat bags. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Come back here.
fast all the blighters. At least <laughs> when you're under such magnification. Alright, you're out of here, fine. Be that way. Alright, so we should actually be getting data pumping into the system now. So we should be able to do cat device TTY USB 1 and we're not. Oh. Why are we not getting data? Hmm. Getting nothing. Now those peacock spiders are quite amazing. Uh, why are we getting nothing today? Here we go again. Actually it might be because I haven't set the terminal Yeah, it looks like we've got data. Unfortunately, it looks like it is bracketed again. I think something I can plug it into to get some logic levels. I was trying to I was kinda of hoping I would see noise, but it just seems like pin three is sticking with whatever it wants to do. Ah Jason <laughs> They can't get here soon enough anyway. I'll be done by tomorrow. Yeah, you buy one and then, yeah, even if I got a bit scope, $150 from, uh, what do you call it, Element 14, it's still going to take a week to get here. Besides, sometimes it's just fun to do this stuff. No, the we're getting the data. The problem is that the data doesn't really seem to be following a pattern I can follow. So what I'm going to do is, where's my DSO? Damn it. Because the DSO has a 1 kilohertz output on it, 5 volts. So I can sort of exploit that. I know what the next thing I need to make is, I need to make a signal generator. That should drive everybody else batty as. Seriously, you're allowed to have fun just reinventing wheels that don't need to be reinvented. Because sometimes you have to add up one plus one so that you can work your way to becoming a mathematician. You can't just buy your mathematics brain. CNC machine? Well, you can buy those too. Why would you bother building one?
No, it's not decoding bug. The the data is coming through as the data is coming through how do I explain this? As expected. In the sense of the high nibble is set to two, which is what I was expecting. So um yeah. Yeah, so that that's our dump. I was just kind of thinking that I would. Okay, no, it, it might actually be working because as I as I fiddle with the cable, you see the data changes. So I'm relying on the high impedance. of the input. So yeah, I think that's actually working. It'll probably it'll settle down again. Still interesting thing though that it's going through the cycle. That's the only thing that confuses me. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering is um no this is not ID four. Yeah, we can do it out of the sound port. We used to actually do that back in the 1980s or so. We used to do that using a parallel port and we would just make a very simple um, D to A resistor tree. Um, and yeah, that worked for some very primitive noises. The parallel port was quite a commonly used thing for that sort of stuff. I'm still not con it's reading data, but I'm still not convinced it's actually generating it right. I don't think it'll be because of the adapter, because I am self-powering this. Usually what happens is with these adapters, where they fall down is when you're expecting the, you know, um, they want the much higher voltage. But funnily enough, like the Mac, this 202 chip I've got here, it will actually be boosting up to the higher voltages so that's not going to be the problem and also last night when we loaded the firmware on this of the actual what it originally was made for it works perfectly fine so it's not the USB adapter it's something in my I am misinterpreting what is happening so as far as I know up here in this interrupt as soon as I load UDRO with a byte, which pin C what am I doing here? That should be OF. Not yeah, that should be OF. Because I want the lower nibble. It still doesn't explain that pattern though. See, someone stole my programmer. Okay, we don't need this useless piece of equipment up here. Get rid of this, throw it in the trash actually. It's about the most appropriate place for many DSOs. The trash.
I think if you've got more bench space and you can dedicate an area just for the DSO and you have a signal generator and all that other stuff and it's all permanently set up, then I think, yeah, it's going to be a nice thing to have. Okay, let's see if it changes when I hold it. Yeah. The pattern is a lot better, even though we do have this problem where it's pumping out no data for some frames. But the pattern is a lot better. It doesn't incrementally fade away. It more strongly holds on, but it is still repeating itself when it shouldn't be. So we've made an improvement. Uh, Bob, the interrupts are enabled after I've set up everything. And so that shouldn't cause any problems because you don't, you know, it wouldn't really matter whether you put it there or there. The interrupt is firing because otherwise we would not get the variation of data. Uh, the problem is something to do with the, I could do it as a while loop in here, like actually wait until the flag comes up to say that it's empty and then load it. But you're wasting time there. Okay. I should just print out the data sheet again one day. Hey, Commutex. So it seems like it's not pumping out the data correctly. It's not shifting the shift register, or we're getting multiple transmissions of the same data. I'm just looking at the um, data sheet at the moment. Okay, UDR zero is indeed the register. And UDR IEO <laughs> sounds like a song. Let me see if we can just expand this a bit more. Ach niemand. Yeah, UDR IEO in this case. So, so we enable the interrupt on the flag. So as soon as it flags, an interrupt is raised. Data register empty interrupt will be generated only if the bit is written to one, and we have done that, which is that bit there. Not likely, Tony, because like I said, we've tested that. We've tested these same settings with the other um, firmware and it comes out fine. It's more looking like it's instead of, how can I explain it? It's more like it's pumping the register or not putting the register out correctly. I don't know. Yeah, but with the AVRs, you basically, you don't need to do that until you get ready to, you can preset everything and then run. And then activate your interrupts and away you go. No, the original, the, while the original circuit was event driven, it, um, the serial output still you know, once you sent that byte to the output, that was it. So.
And the fact that the data is coming out as it's got the high nibble set at 2 means it must be doing it right. Because if it was a mistiming issue or anything like that, then that would get mangled. Well, we can do it the slow while way, where we don't actually engage any interrupts. And the slow while way is simply this. Um, I always forget the exact. It's easy for me to cut and paste this. I've got an example in here, so it's just I may as well use it. Basically, this bit of code does exactly the same thing as what the interrupt handler does, uh, except that we've got um, in zero, 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 pin C, and bracket that to absolutely guaranteed order of operations the reason why I make and then go ahead and do this is just in case I've got something like a an error in my code and it comes back with a compile error then I'm not sitting here holding this damn thing while I wait for that okay now we've got the same thing same behavior it, it's definitely picking up you know the logic signals but why is it gapping it out like that? I just don't know. Um, we'll bump it up to 3.0 because 2.0 is a space in hex. So if we bump it up to 3.0, that's going to... Uh, I don't know exactly what it's going to be. It it doesn't need set TDY, nothing like that. The comms side of it is fine. I can actually prove it to you by doing something in a second but first I'm going to do this because when we ran it in terminal mode before with you, oh shit okay now that's different because that should have been 3 o. is it still running interrupts? I think it is even though it's silent and also that's why for a moment then I thought magic was happening and it wasn't, it was just me alright So you can see there are blocks, and it's odd, it's almost like it's 10 bits. So 8, no it's 11 bits, no 11 bytes, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
one, two, three, four, five, eleven. So it's always nine bytes and then eleven bytes. Nine bytes and eleven bytes. And it's not because there might be nine bits set or anything like that, because that would actually be the individual byte. It's not the number of bytes. No, it's not UTF. No, it's not ASCII. This is all pure ASCII. Trust me, guys. It's it's not the comms. Now it's going to become the comms because I told you to trust me. It's starting to hate you all now. It's going to be something truly dumb. I can guarantee you that. Something dumb. I can add another stop bit fairly easily, yes. But I don't think it's necessary. I'm just going to go check this section here. I have a feeling that might be off. UCSR, okay, OC is what I want. No, uh, we're not doing the interrupt version now, we're, we're just doing the pumped uh, polling method. Uh, let's see. Parity mode is disabled. Bit settings. USB. Okay, that might be something. One USB S O That's for the stop bit settings. The character bit settings. Zero one and zero zero, and I just realised I've kind of doubled up there. USB is okay. Let's try that. There might be a winner. I know there's some few reads people. This actually gives you guys a good idea of just how frustrating or how much time and energy goes into developing even simple products. Alright, that looks a little more lively. But it's the same thing really. It's yeah, it's the same thing. It's only at 9600, it's fine. It's not that. There's no corruption in the data. Um, okay. Actually, I'm missing something damn simple here. And I know that because after many years of coding these devices, I know that it is incredibly normal to miss something dumb. <laughs> Incredibly simple to miss something dumb. I think the zero by uh, the zeros that you see, that is when the pin C is not being loaded in. It's like it pumps out a byte without pin C present. So what we're going to do is we're going to force it to not even worry about the pin data. And we're just going to make it do the letter U. And as you can see, when you pump out the letter U, it's perfect. This is what I'm talking about. It's fine.
So for some reason, when I try to read pin C, it's not reading properly. Let's see. Now normally there should be no problem just simply doing what I've got here, which is you know, take the pin C, it's a byte and pump it straight into UDRO. It's very frustrating when things do not do that. And by default, um, you should be able to just read them, even when they are on a right output state. I'm just checking on some stuff here. Sorry, I'm a bit distracted. They seem to have changed the way they've written this documentation. Okay, define and pull up. Right, so if I want the pin to be an input, then yeah, what I've got is right. Reading pin value, independent of the setting of the D DDR bit, data direction bit, port pin can be read through the pin XN register bit as shown in the figure. Maybe I can't take it as a whole byte anymore. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it just won't read the whole byte in one hit. I always thought you could. I mean, I could. I'll be pretty wrong, but uh, so what I'm going to do what I'm going to do is compose it individually, like UDR naught equals. It just doesn't make sense. Um, anyway, pin C. Pin C naught, one, two, and three. So naught. They even give an example here. That's weird. Uh, let me show you the example. Ah, oh, damn it. Okay, I can't 
damn it, the mouse won't move for whatever reason, but if you look at the bottom of the C code example, it says, it's right there, it says I equals pin B. So I should be able to just go I equals pin C. I'll put in a knob just in case it needs to be synchronized, but, oh crap, come on, let go up here. Maybe I'll make it a temporary variable. Unsigned char i. Make it a volatile one too. I equals pin C. I can't imagine why that would make a difference, but when it comes to these sort of microcontrollers, sometimes these sort of things can happen. You know, it can, for some reason, it won't allow you to mig you know, transfer a register to register directly. It has to be an intermediate variable. Like I said, these quirks can keep you going for weeks. Okay, no. Still at the same problem. No, nah, there's. It wouldn't even matter about endiness because it's just. It's um, I is not a word. They're all just eight bit. We are to fourteen two four. There is no fourteen two four section on this document. Ah, no, 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 no. We're not doing the interrupt process right now. See, we've cancelled that. This is just simply the polled start because we thought, well, maybe it's the interrupt issue. You know, maybe there's something in the stack that's messing with it. We're not doing that. What we're doing here is we're just waiting for the transmit buffer to be empty and then we're loading it up with the um, pin C. Picture's not frozen. I'm not in the um, ISR anymore and we're getting the same results. And like I said, if I, in this section here, if I set this to a character, it will work just fine. I think I'll just plug along and no, buy a cup. That. Yeah. Uh, Tom, pin the byte 
pin A, B, C, D, etc. refer to the entire port. Okay, I think I just fried something. Um, yeah, so within the 8 bit byte of pin B or pin C, it contains the state of all the individual actual pins. So you have uh, PCO, PC1, PC2 contained within pin C. Damn it, I disconnected my programmer. Nope, pin C doesn't require pull-out resistors because the the it's purely readings. It's not trying to assert anything. It's just reading it. If I put pull-out resistors, it will actually mangle things. There, see, there you go. See. So for some reason, when I try to read pin C, it gets upset. I do wonder though Well, we can do this. Uh, let's see, I equals pin C. Um, pin And then we'll also actually add on to that. So it starts becoming a bit unwieldy. Maybe there's an auto output no that doesn't make sense nothing makes sense until you find the solution and then you go ah that makes so much sense It is Meg 48. 10 to 4. Okay, I was at 10 to 4, but we'll go back to there again. Yeah, that's where I was. So that that 1024 section, that's more a case of when you assert a value onto that pin and then how quickly can you get around to reading that value back. But the pin values are actually already being asserted um, externally, so and we're only reading. And it still shouldn't it still shouldn't result in the kind of effect that we're seeing with all these weird you know, zeros. Instead, what we should see 
is just maybe it being delayed by one byte so you know, might have just one zero there It's not interference, no. Hey, really, Nicker. No, you don't need to um, disable JTAG because JTAG has to be explicitly enabled. That's the thing, you know, if it's not explicitly enabled, then these ports and pins just simply fall back to default, which is simply they'll uh, read whatever is out there. Missing something very dumb here. Yeah, Travis, exactly, yep. The problem isn't the pins being sensed. The problem is that we aren't getting the... Regardless of whatever is in pin C, the byte pin C, regardless of what's in that, What's going wrong here is that when we try to load it into the USART output register, as in you know, the data that's going to be transmitted, it's getting there one time, but then with the next uh, byte that's been sent out, it's not getting there. So, whereas when we load it with a fixed value it's fine it gets there every time so it doesn't matter what data we're getting out of pin c the problem is that it's only showing up every sort of second time rather than every time that's the problem and there's no real threshold settings as such this is just purely on off um, whatever internally is set for the AVRs so it's not what data is on there it's a case of it's not loading it in properly can you slow the loop um, yeah you can but like I said it works perfectly fine if you load it up with uh, it's an 18 mega 48 Okay, let's do this horribly dirty then. This is really horribly dirty. Out unsigned and okay. Tom because 
because of the pattern that it's showing, I know it's not that data. Because I've been using these little bastard chips for 15 years now. And yet I still get snagged on silly things every now and then. Okay, so we go... AB equals uh, AB four equals pin C Yeah, well I'm just gonna use one pin. So we're just going to use one pin. That's it. And we'll start out with OB being OX3 O. And we'll see how this changes, if anything. Um, Bob, yeah, I mean, you can do that, but there's no need to because we don't really care when the pin state changes because we're just simply taking a snapshot every time. We're synchronizing with when the serial port is ready to send. That's basically what it is. We're synchronizing with the serial port, not with the pin changes. And let's see... By the way, 3x, that's for a earlier model chip. It's not for this one. Wait, what? Called object is not a functional pointer. Oh, whoops. It would be nicer if it said you're missing a semicolon at the end of that. Yeah. There's the fun part with C compilers is that usually they give you error, helpful error messages that are as cryptical as the code. Uh, now we've got something different going on here. Dump. Hex dump. Okay, everything's zero. And I know why, because that should have been or. It's fun with C when you drop a brace somewhere and you don't know where and the compiler will basically say there's a problem at the end of the file and it's like actually the problem's the missing brace somewhere between the end and the start all right now so this is better yeah 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 that's more like it that's more like it i think The number of zeros is changing. Like, let's see, we've got this here, and there's. Okay. That's more like it. Now we're getting somewhere. Now this is again very dirty and I apologize but this is called breaking things down into teeny tiny increments so that you can assemble it all together and pick out where the real fault is occurring. And people say, why don't you use a debugger, why don't you use a simulator, why don't you use this? And it's like, because really at the end of the day 
it doesn't really speed things up that much. Most of this problem we have with speed here at the moment is the fact that I'm answering all silly people. No, just kidding. <laughs> Okay, I wonder if all three of them are getting triggered, or so all of them are getting triggered. I need to tie a couple of these pins to ground, I think. Okay, now that I've splayed them out everywhere... What is the bet that that periocracy is actually 60 hertz or 50 hertz? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering whether that is actually the EMI around causing the signal. So what I need to do is find something to plug it into, a common bus path. Oh, here we go. Now that I've just ruined everything. Um, we'll disconnect all but one. No, back to that bullshit again. Yeah, it is high impedance, which is why I'm thinking it might be picking up. Uh, we, looks like we've still got a problem. Those 888s are coming up from somewhere. Damn it, it's driving me mad. Is Lewis streaming at the moment? What a jerk. Is the guy has no respect. Uh, I'm just going to tie this to ground, which is that pin there. Okay, tied to ground, that's all zeros. I'm pretty sure this is 60 hertz or 50 hertz related. I need to find a better clock source. Unfortunately, all I've got is this monstrous one kilohertz source. And I need to get a piece of wire to do what I need to do. It's sad that it's been, you know, it's sad that for so long I haven't done this kind of stuff that I don't have equipment to make it easy, like, you know, have a fixed reference frequency source or, um, yeah, all that sort of stuff just ready to go on hand. Instead, I've got to hodgepodge everything. I mean, it makes it fun, but sometimes it can be annoying. Okay, I need to just double that up. Kind of helps if I turn it on there. And I just realized I need a ground as well. So I have to get another piece of wire for the ground. Mm. 
just realized it's midnight. Just turned midnight a minute ago. Serious cringe factor here. Okay, a bit my little wire go for ground. This Paul struggles to see. Can't say I'm a believer yet. <laughs> oh, actually, no, maybe I am a believer now. All right. I just switched that over to the first pin, and now we've got 0 1, 0 1, 0 1. I wonder what format Sigrock uses, and if I can. Yeah, adapt that. The reason why I want to try that, I'm going to pump the frequency up now and see if we get. So, like, we're using it's four up, five down, and that's, and that switches occasionally. Occasionally, it's five up, four down. So I'm going to push up the board frequency and see if we can get, like we're on 9600 now, so if we try 19200, we should get a doubling of those um, counts. So I want 25 as my... There's no real point setting that. Okay. As I risk life and limb with all these grounds, different grounds at that too, being interconnected. <laughs> Something's going to go bang soon. I don't think my workshop equipment setup is such that I have, I do not have a common ground tie point. So sooner or later something's going to get upset and there's going to be a few thousand volts jumping across. Oh, I know what's going on there. I haven't set the terminal. Going back to one zeros now. All right, I'm going to postulate that the what we were seeing before was an aliasing effect. Now we should be able to compute this. So we're doing nineteen two hundred. Let's let's call it twenty thousand um, bits per second. So therefore, each cycle this is one kilohertz isn't it yeah it's one kilohertz okay so there's each cycle is 20 
So what we're seeing now actually is about the threshold. We need to go up another level or two. Let's try 11,500. And for that we want a UBR. Uh, the only trouble is we've got an awful... Our error margins get out of control. Okay, let's try 38,400. Which is 12. You can actually get away with any board rate you like when you're talking AVR to AVR. And you know, if they're both running the same clock frequency and you use the same UBRR values, then yeah, you can have absolutely any board rate you like. But when you're talking to a PC or through these adapters, then they're going to be expecting certain preset values. And so you have to kind of meet those margins. Uh, yeah, of course, once again, I have to... What did I say I was doing? 38400, was it? Yeah, 38400, so D. And that's good. And that seems roughly about right. About two apiece. Yeah. So it looks like we're reading the signals about right now. I'm kind of curious if we... So I don't really want to put in this into an interrupt. It's fairly heavy for an interrupt. But what I can try to do is compact it down. Maybe that's what was going on. Okay, experiment time. This is the nice thing. Once you've got yourself a standard, you can start experimenting away from that standard and seeing if things go right again. Yeah. Pin C and... People are going to go, why are you going back to what you were already doing? Yeah, unused variable, shock horror. And I have a feeling this time it might actually work. Or maybe not. I don't, oh, I forgot to... I forgot to prepend the 3 -0. For the final result, I won't be having that there. It's just simply so that when it comes out on the ASCII terminal, it's human readable. There we go. Alright. So, it looks like what might have been happening before is because the board rate was so slow, it was the reason why the data didn't seem to make sense to what we were looking at is simply because it was just having a um, what we call an aliasing effect due to the sample rate being too slow. Um, if, you, if you Google that, just um, Google um, low sampling rate aliasing or even when your sampling rate starts approaching the rate of your signal you get this weird aliasing effect where what should be a very fast waveform actually starts becoming just this very slow waveform. It's kind of like when you uh, slide a, a mesh or a um, vertical grid or a horizontal grid over a picture and depending on the picture you can sort of see different patterns emerge. Anyway, uh, so that's really that then. 
so I think my code originally did work, it was just my sampling understanding of what I was reading was wrong. Yeah, we can always GG. There you are. Perfect indenting now. So from here, I would probably be trying to push the data rate up. Ideally, I want to get up to. I think we can do with a double pump. Oh, that's what I can do. Yeah, I can get fifty. Sorry, just ignore me for a moment. I can get 76.8. Or... I'll try 250k with a double data pump rate. Okay. So we enable the double data. And our... Uh, will be three. I can actually get up to a half um, to one megabit, but I don't know if this here will handle that. These are my glasses, not on my head. Okay, so this is supposed to be 250. So supposedly that. It definitely does not seem to be that. Did I misread that? I have a feeling that this device is not coping with that speed. So 76.8, can we do that? No, I've got 11.52 and that's it. Bugger. If I want to get the higher rates and still stay um, relatively error free or you know, within a reasonable tolerance, I'll have to use a different frequency oscillator. Yeah. Oh, well, we know it works for 38.4. It's just a shame I can't get. Uh, why can't I set it at 76.8? Oh, there's 23 of her. Weird. Oops. Oh, for goodness sake. Um, we'll try that. Doesn't seem right. Yep. No, oh, well, it looks like 38 for is our limit for the moment. Oh, well. That's a shame. So the actual device here will cope with, um, it can generate up to one megabit 
data output on the serial port at 8 megahertz but I think that the bridge can't handle it and then I suspect this might not be able to either yeah, let's try it anyway let's see 1 megabit we've got the 2 multiplier and we set it to just 0 so this really just runs flat out no time for anything just flat out I could probably do it if I actually don't bother with the bridge chip and if I just simply go straight f uh, you can get the FT232s and things like that that just simply take logic level and straight into USB that's what we will actually be wanting because the slowdown is likely in trying to make the voltage swing have an, well, enough energy in those caps Yeah, it's not coping with it. No. Alright. Back to boring old 38400. That's a shame. That clock cycle is awful low. Oh well. Anyway, well, I think that's it. I'm done for tonight. Maybe noisy wiring. No, it's not noisy wiring in this case. Um, if it was noisy wiring, I would expect to still see some valid bits come through, but that was just purely... It just couldn't keep up. I'll see if I've got one of the direct 5 volt logic to USB converters. I'm pretty sure I do, I that or threw it away. But uh, I'll be interested to plug it in and see if I have any luck with it. But anyway, I'm done for it. Do you want, you are making me want to go home and pull out my Mega 328P and program them? Oh, you should do that. It's always fun. Yeah. And maybe tomorrow I'll actually have something real, like fixing a MacBook, unlike the one tonight, which probably just ends up being that bad battery and bad DC inboard. Speaking of which, we should actually check to see what the battery state is, now that I think about it. Let's see if it even... It looks like it's fan spinning. It's probably been fan spinning the whole time. And spinning across the universe. Yeah. I probably should do a few more AVR projects simply because you know, keep the brain fresh. Okay, now let's see if it keeps running after the batteries. Yep, there we go. Alright. So, bad DC inboard. End of... That's it. Oh. Leave it at that. You'll take care. See you tomorrow.